Hey, listen, you know what Rob was saying earlier is really true. It's good. It's good to pray. Uh, Paul says to the Ephesians, he says, be constantly being filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, so we're to be in that place where we're constantly being filled uh, with the Holy Spirit. And, and, and something, just a little something he said. I think some of us maybe are a little, maybe a little reluctant to pray for that because of the excesses that we see in, in some parts of um, the church. Uh, the ultra charismatic or Pentecostal churches are a little leery, you know, some of that stuff that we see. And uh, so it's like, oh, I don't know. Um, we need to understand that when the Holy Spirit comes, Jesus made it very clear that when the Holy Spirit came, uh, he would make us witnesses of, of him, of him. That's right. And, and Jesus said to the disciples that last night, as we've been reading here, it's to your advantage that I go away because if I go away, I'll send the Holy Spirit, the comforter to come who will, who will live in you. He's been with you. He will be in you. And then later he says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will be witnesses of me. So you, you want to know how uh, the Holy Spirit is at work in someone? They look like Jesus. They sound like Jesus. They uh, smell like Jesus. They're not gonna, we're not going to see weirdness. We're not going to see odd things happening. We can expect very much the picture that we have of Jesus in the Gospels to be duplicated in the lives of his people. Amen? So that's how we know the Holy Spirit is really at work. It's not that odd things or weird things are happening, but that, well, wow, it, that looks like Jesus. That sounds like Jesus. And because that's what the Holy Spirit comes to do, to glorify Christ in us. As we come to our text tonight, we got through about a little less than half of chapter 18 last week. Jesus has been arrested in Gethsemane and hauled back to the high priest's house for what ends up being a sham trial. Let's pick it up at verse 15. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. The another disciple here is John's awkward way of referring to himself. You know, by the time that John had composed his account of Jesus' story, he'd matured into a well-seasoned saint. And my, my notes just went completely blank. Which is, which is always fun. That's why you have a backup right there. <laughs> Take that, devil. <laughs> so by the time that John composes his story, remember, the other three Gospels have already been written. John writes his last. That's why his is so different from the others, because he's not going to repeat what he knows are in the others. He's filling in details. And so by the time he's writing, he's, he's a well-matured and experienced saint. And one of the things that he had internalized and learned himself was this oft-repeated lesson that Jesus taught on the importance of humility and being a servant. So when he writes his gospel, he doesn't even refer to himself other than that other disciple, another disciple, the disciple Jesus loved. He won't even say, it was me. He's showing this humility, this remarkable humility by not even referring to himself in the first person. Mark tells us that when Jesus was arrested, the disciples scattered. It didn't take long before both Peter and John collected their wits, turned around, and they followed the mob back to Annas' house. Now, John was known to the high priest, most likely through uh, his family business. And again, what was John? He was a fisherman. He and his brother James, uh, their father Zebedee, they had a fairly successful commercial fishing venture up on the Sea of Galilee, which provided uh, fish for many of the wealthy in the city of Jerusalem, including the high priest's home. And so it's likely that John had brought a shipment of fish to Jerusalem, had passed it off there uh, to the servants in the high priest's house. And so he's known there. He's known in their house, in their, in their home. And that gains him entrance into the courtyard where the trial is being held. Verse 16, but Peter stood at the door outside. Well, because he doesn't have the connections. You know, the servants keep out. Peter comes in, he says, I, I want to come in there. And they, we don't know you. John, they had known. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door and brought Peter in. So John knows that Peter is uh, 
out the gate and secures his entrance. He, you know, goes up to the girl. Oh, I know this guy. You can let him in. Verse 17. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Uh, the gatekeeper fingers Peter as a disciple. Now, let's think about this. Those of you that are longtime members of Calvary Chapel, would a disciple ever not acknowledge that they were a disciple of a rabbi? Was that, is that ever going to happen? No. Because remember that that is what every young guy growing up in Galilee wanted to be, was a disciple of a rabbi. You would never disown your rabbi unless your rabbi is on trial now for blasphemy and he's now been made uh, the enemy, the opponent of all the powerful in Israel. And so Peter does something unthinkable. He denies that he is a disciple. Verse 18, now the servants and officers who had made a fire of coal stood there, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So these are the police and the officials who'd gone to Gethsemane to arrest Jesus. Their job isn't done. They have to stay there and guard the prisoner until the verdict has been rendered on him. And so there they are. It's getting late. A chill has come into the air, which tells us it's at a time of year uh, when it's still prone to be cold. So this isn't during late spring or summer or even early fall. Uh, this is, of course, we know it's around the time of Passover. And so it's early in the year at night. It gets chilly there. They start a fire and there they are warming, warming their hands around the fire. And Peter, you know, he kind of sidles up among them so he can warm himself. Verse 19. The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, do you answer the high priest like that? Jesus answered him, if I've spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? The entire examination before Annas was a mockery of justice. Jewish law forbade questions, the answer to which would incriminate the accused. They weren't, you, you couldn't do this. You couldn't ask questions of the person on trial where their answers would actually condemn them. That was, that was not permitted. Witnesses had to be brought who could establish the facts. And when the crime was worthy of death, which is what Annas was gunning for here, there had to be a minimum of three witnesses whose testimony all agreed. Now, the other Gospels tell us that witnesses were brought, but none of their testimonies lined up. In frustration, Annas demanded that Jesus answer for himself. All Jesus is saying by way of reply in verses 20 and 21 is that Jerusalem was filled with people who had heard what he had to say. There were no lack of credible witnesses. The problem is not one of the people that would come to give true testimony is going to say anything that's going to condemn him. You see, they're only bringing false witnesses, and they can't even get their testimony to line up. So, when Jesus gives this totally appropriate reply, one of the officers slaps him, which is another offense to justice. But Jesus never had any hope of justice with these guys. They've already condemned him. They're just looking for something that they can say, see, you know, but in their minds, they're determined to find that. Well, verse 24, then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. And you might say, well, why, why wasn't he taken to the high priest's house before? Well, we, we looked at this last week. Even though Caiaphas has been appointed high priest by the Romans, who's the real high priest? It's his father-in-law, Annas, the previous high priest. Well, actually, <laughs> the previous high priest back a ways. <laughs> Annas is an older man. He had been high priest. He had upset the Romans. They had deposed him. And then the Romans had set up each of his four sons as high priest. They lasted for a few months. <laughs> and then finally, well, we need to find somebody else. Well, next in line, his son-in-law. <laughs> they must be scraping the bottom of the barrel now, right? A son-in-law. And so, by, so that's why Caiaphas is the high priest. 
But Annas is like, oh, I can't find anything. So he sends him over to Caiaphas, whose house is probably sharing the same courtyard there in Jerusalem. Verse 25. Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, meaning that, you know, the other officers that are standing around, you are not also one of his disciples, are you? Sounds familiar. He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him, whose ear Peter had cut off. <laughs> I saw you <laughs> swinging that sword. Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Just as Jesus foretold, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And the third time it's out of his mouth, and there goes the rooster crowing exactly as Jesus had foretold. And it was at that moment, hearing that rooster, that Peter, then the other gospels tell us, that Peter remembered what Jesus had said, looked across the courtyard to see Jesus looking at him. Just imagine, just imagine that. So, hey, listen, we went into all of this about Peter warming himself at the enemy's fire, you know, being where he's not supposed to be and his denial. When we were in the Gospel of Luke, I encourage you for a really poignant, really good study, uh, go back and, and listen to that study in the Gospel of Luke. It's online and you can listen to it there. Okay, verse 28. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Praetorium. So, you know, in the other Gospels, we, we read about what happens with Caiaphas. Again, John's you can read it there. He's filling in the details. The Praetorium was the governor's palace. And we don't know, quite frankly, if this was the Antonio Fortress, which was right next to the temple, or if this was one of Herod's mansions in the western part of the city. Uh, they wanted to execute Jesus, but the Romans had revoked the Jewish right to carry out capital punishment. And so that meant they had to take Jesus to the Romans, and get the Romans to do it. So that, that's why they're going to Pilate. He's the governor. Normally, he's stationed out on the coast at Caesarea, but it's Passover. Uh, the city is packed. It's a powder keg at this time. And so that's why they bring extra troops from Caesarea up to Jerusalem, and the governor is there at this time. And it was early morning, we read in verse 28, but they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled so that they might eat the Passover. So check this out. The, the Jewish leaders refused to go under a Gentile's roof for fear of contamination. Since it was Passover, they were extra careful to avoid anything that would mean they can't eat the special Passover meal. Interesting, they would care about that, yet they had no qualms about condemning an innocent man. Folks, listen. When you're religious but you're not truly godly. It's amazing the rules you will keep while you cover your immorality. It's just, it's absurd. It is just so absurd. Over the years, and, and I, I'm not saying this is true, obviously, of all churchgoers, for goodness sake, but uh, I remember when I was a young man growing up, uh, going to a, a, a church with my family and seeing people, you know, men, uh, that, would, that would be wearing suits and ties, and you'd go to church, and they would sing the hymns, and they taught Sunday school, and their wives were all dressed up in their dresses, and, you know, the, the, the flowers and the bonnets and everything else. And, and they, in church, they're singing the hymns, and they know when to stand and when to sit at just the right times. So, you know, they're standing before the pastor even says, let's stand, and they're sitting before he says, have a seat. They, they know the liturgy. They know the routine. And then you see them outside the church and, and they, they treat people horribly. They act God, they know the routine, but when it comes time to live the life, it's like they think that all they have to do is just go to church and bob and weave at the right time and God is appeased. And they can just live whatever way they want the rest of their time. Here are these religious leaders. They know their religion backwards and forwards. I mean, they could argue apologetics with the best of us but they want to kill an innocent man. Why? What's the reason why? What, what is, why are they so against Jesus? Envy. It's envy. They were envious of him. The last part of verse 28 presents a problem for us. It says that they might eat the Passover. Well, wait a minute. What meal did Jesus just have with the disciples? Has that ever bothered you? 
For these guys, Passover was later that day. That's why they don't want to go into Pilate's house. And yet, the Last Supper was a Passover meal. So, how's, how's this work out? The answer is a bit complicated. Let me summarize. There are two ways to reconcile this. First, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had a huge debate over the calendar right at that time. Their calendars varied by a single day. With the common people and the Pharisees opting for the Passover one day before the Sadducees and most of the wealthy celebrated Passover. And the high priest and his group were Sadducees. So Jesus would very much have more uh, aligned himself with the common people and the Pharisees. So he, it, they were keeping this calendar that was one day before the calendar of the Sadducees. And it was just a, a really short period of time in Jewish history when the Pharisees and the Sadducees divided over their calendar. Then they patched stuff up. So that may be one, one explanation. Another one is this. There were so many pilgrims that, had, uh, that came to Jerusalem each year, and, and it's interesting because Josephus actually gives us a count, and it's estimated that the population of Jerusalem may have tripled during the time of the Passover. Uh, and, and there were so... Now think about this. Uh, the priests are having to sacrifice all these sheep for a meal on one day? And so the thought was... Hey, listen, simply to get in all of the slaughtering of the sheep that was needed for all of the Passover meals, they had spread the Passover feast over two days, saying that all pilgrims, everybody from outside Jerusalem and its neighborhood, had to have the Passover a day early, and then the residents of Jerusalem and its neighborhood, Judea, uh, they would celebrate it on the day of Passover. So either it's the calendar or it's this, you know, hey, we simply have too many sheep to sacrifice to get it all done on one day. So we're going to spread it over two days. Pilgrims the day before and then residents on that day. So, of course, Jesus was from where? Is he, uh, is he a native to Jerusalem? No, he, he's from Galilee and so are all the disciples. They're all from up there. And so they would be eating it the day before. Verse 29. Then Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? So remember, they won't come under his roof, so he has to go out to them. And he says, what's up? What are you accusing this guy of? They answered and said to him, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Uh, when Pilate hears that the priests have arrived to issue charges against Jesus, he knew they were seeking the death penalty because if this was a lesser matter, they would have handled it themselves. And so he asks, so what's the charge? And instead of specifying what it is, do you know what they say? Trust us, he should die. That oblique answer moves Pilate to conclude, this is just another one of their religious controversies. They're all riled up about it, which was a regular, <laughs> a regular occurrence with these guys. They get worked up about, as far as Pilate's concerned, nothing. So verse 31, then Pilate said to them, you take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore, the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? So uh, what, what is John saying here? How does this signify by what death he would die? Well, how did Romans execute people? Crucifixion, that, that's, that's the point. They, they, they really just use crucifixion for foreigners. And so that's John's implying that we know some history here uh, and that the Jews have lost their ability uh, to execute. They did not crucify. The, the Jews stoned people to death. That was the method of capital punishment that they, they used. So the, the priests... Uh, the priests finally give Pilate something to be concerned about. They accuse Jesus of claiming to be Israel's king. And that was something the Romans would be all over like tattoos on a hipster. <laughs> uh, 
they'd already been troubled by numerous false messiahs that had come, raised insurrections. Uh, I mean, history, we know from history there was a, a whole line of these, these guys. I'm the messiah, you know, and follow me and we'll kick the Romans out. There had been a whole bunch. And they would go, they'd attack some Roman outposts, they'd kill some Romans, and they'd have this kind of momentary success, which would bring more of their supporters out of the woodworks and their ranks would swell and then the Romans would just say yeah that's enough and they'd go and they'd put it down and every time they did as we've seen before they would go to the religious leaders and they would say it's your duty to stop this kind of stuff before it happens because you didn't we're going to punish you you can no longer be high priest pick a new high priest you see so that's why Annas has been deposed and then his son and then his next son and his next because they haven't been able to put down these kind of insurrections so what do they do they come with the charge he's claiming to be one of them we're doing our job. We're putting down this insurrection. And that, of course, is they know that's the kind of thing Pilate would be like. Wait, what? He's claiming to be what? So they're all over it. Verse 34, Jesus answered him. Are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. And for this cause I was born. And for this cause I have come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, well, what is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I, I find no fault in him at all. Hey, listen, folks, this is a super important passage. And so we have to come back to it on Sunday. Uh, we'll unpack these verses on Sunday. Come back. It's an important message. Verse 39. Now, Pilate is still speaking, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a robber. So at this point, Pilate knows that he's going to be turning Jesus back over to the priests and that they'll probably take out on him what fury and violence they can. They, they may even conspire to murder him if Pilate won't do it for them. So he's looking for a way to release Jesus into the oversight of those that will protect him. You see, every year at Passover, as a way to mollify the huge crowds that had come to Jerusalem with messianic interest and fervor rising so high, the Romans had gotten into the practice of releasing a prisoner. A crowd had gathered for this that morning, Pilate goes out before them and offers Jesus' release because, listen, he's, he knows he's, he's the governor of Israel. He's been paying attention. He has people telling him what's going on with the Jews and their leadership and the common people. He knows what's going on. And he knows that the, it's the religious leaders' envy of Jesus that is driving this. He, he knows that. And he knows that the common people are not really going along with the religious leaders. There's been tension between the common people and them, the religious leaders, for quite a while. Remember that the religious leaders come from a sect called the Sadducees that weren't really that popular with the common people. And so uh, he thinks the, the people for sure are going to pick Jesus because the Sadducees want him dead. So he thinks this is a way to protect Jesus. Well, it's not the way it works out. The other option that, that he presents before them is uh, this brigand named Barabbas, a common thief and murderer who's no one's hero. In Pilate's calculation, Jesus was that the hands-down winner of the pardon. What he didn't know was that the priests had been circulated among the crowds and the common people that had gathered for the release of a prisoner, no doubt on their minds, they're going to ask for Jesus. But the priests have been circulating through the crowd and they're saying, we're going to be out here among y'all and we're going to be listening. And if we hear anybody call for Jesus, you're going to be excommunicated from the synagogue. 
You'll be, you'll be done. So you, you will be committing social suicide. So you, you call for Barabbas or life's over. So when Pilate opened the choice, the call for Barabbas outweighed the calls for Jesus. When asked what was to be done with Jesus, the crowd caved to the provocation of the priests and called for his crucifixion. Now, what's interesting about this little detail that John includes is that the name Barabbas, uh, you guys help me out. For those of you that have been Bible study students for a while, help me out. Barabbas, bar Abbas. Bar means what? Son of, and what is Abba? So what does Barabbas mean? Son of the Father. Who's the son of the father here? Jesus. Who do they pick? Barabbas. The false son of the father. You know what we're seeing here? A foreshadowing of a much later selection of the Jews for a false Messiah. The Antichrist. Who will come presenting himself as their savior and he's in fact their tormentor. Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name and you have rejected me. Another will come in his own name and him you will accept. Speaking of the Antichrist, but also looking at the Antichrist through this selection right here. Verse 1, chapter 19. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Pilate hoped that a good beating would be enough to mollify the priest's hostility. And so he has Jesus, scour Jesus scourged. Scourging was done with a whip of about a dozen lashes. Each lash embedded with pieces of bone and metal. Now we're not told how many lashes Jesus was given, but the usual amount meted out by the Romans was between 20 and 40 lashes. The goal was to rip the flesh of the back into ribbons. And the lashing took place from the base of the skull to the knees. The victim was stripped naked. Uh, their hands were tied around a post so that their back was exposed. And then the lash was applied. Some of the scourge died of the beating when their ribs and internal organs were exposed. Jesus' scourging was particularly savage. That's why he died so quickly. Jesus hung for six hours on the cross before he expired. The, the typical person that was crucified would last from one to two days before they died. And Jesus died in six hours because he had been scourged so severely. Verse 2. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Emboldened by Jesus' mute acceptance of the scourging, the soldiers decided to have some sport with him before turning him back over to Pilate. They'd known constant abuse from the Jews, and this was their chance to give some of it back. Uh, to, to give you an idea, why were they so fierce in their, you know, what, what are they doing to you? Well, he's... What's his charge? What's the title they've given to him? King of the Jews. Um, how, how do Jews feel about Gentiles? Just generally, how do they feel about Gentiles? Not so hot, right? How do they feel about Gentiles that are uh, oppressing them? That are occupying their holy city? That have a fortress right next to the temple? How, how do the Jews in Jerusalem feel about that? How much abuse do you think the Romans experienced as they would walk the streets when they would go out, you know, in their squads and do their rounds through the streets of Jerusalem. How, how much abuse do you suppose that they suffered? How many times were they spit on, had sewage thrown on them? You can be sure it was a regular occurrence. And now they're in their fortress and they have this guy who's called who? The king of the Jews, you can be sure, all of that pent-up anger and hatred is coming out as, as the object to just annihilate this guy. So they, they tear into him with a scourging. 
when the scourging is done, they, they don't want to kill him. They want to put him on that cross. They want to mock him that way. And so they, they lash him to an inch of his life. And then, then they unchain him from the pole and they sit him down. And someone goes and gets a, a, some thorns and makes a crown and sticks that on his head. Now, the, the crown of thorns uh, was very likely taken from one of the acacia bushes. The thorns are about that long. They're very sharp. You want to see what a crown of thorns looks like? When you go out that door tonight, look up at the cross that's made from the bushes that are used over there to make crowns like this. It's right up there. We got it from Israel. It's on the top of the cross there. You ever had a cut in your scalp? I mean, his back's in ribbons. You put that crown up there. It's just blood just pouring down his head. They put a robe around him to mock him, and they have their fun. The other Gospels tell us they spat in his face. They plucked out his beard. Friends, it's here we see the restraint of Christ most fully. I really believe it's here in this mocking. Because you know at a word from him? At a word from him? All of the torment and pain that has been inflicted on him, he could have easily have set on every one of them. Just like that. He, he, could have, he could have fried them all right there. He could have just called down fire from heaven and killed them all. An instantaneous death. Or he could have caused every nerve in their body to start misfiring. He could have given them all Guillain-Barre or, or, or some other nerve, uh, neuralgia or something that would have made them all feel like they were burning in fire. Just like that. But he didn't. He remained quiet. He let them do what they intended to do. And he didn't stop it. I think it's here we see the restraint of Christ most fully. And you know why he did it? For you. For you. You know, all of this is just the lead up to the crucifixion. It's at the cross where he's going to pay for our sins. All, the, all this ahead of the cross. He didn't have to endure all this. But he did. I don't think any other human being could go through this and not stop it. And you know what's right here? Not only do we see the restraint of Christ, but on the other side of it, what do we see? we see? We see a man without sin here going through this. But you know what we see on the other side? The absolute depravity of man. When the perfect God becomes one of us and becomes susceptible to us, you know, we, we, we say, oh, if we could only see God, well, when he came so we could see him. If I could only hear God when he came so that we could hear him. If I could only touch him when he becomes one of us so that actually we did touch him. We lay hands on him. We clap him in chains. We rip off his clothes. And we tear the flesh from his back. The perfect God becomes one of us. And this is what we do to him. And you might say, well, I didn't do it. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. So on one hand, you have this amazing, amazing example of long-suffering. I mean, it really gives that word a whole new meaning. And over here, you see the absolute insanity and depravity of, of man apart from God at the same moment. Man cannot be good without God, folks. We can't. The promise of humanism that man will achieve his potential, that humanity will rise to its glory 
is an utter, absolute fiction. Man, apart from God, is bent towards evil. He's not good. And he can't be good without God. Verse 4, Pilate then went out again and said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, and that you may know that I find no fault in him. And Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Pilate thought for sure that this pitiful spectacle of the beaten Jesus would mollify the crowd, and for pity's sake they would agree to his release. But he miscalculated. Verse 6, Therefore, when the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. Now the priests knew that what Pilate was trying to do, and so saw the crowd's horror when presented with Jesus, so they quickly pick up the call for crucifixion. Having already been warned by the priests what would happen if they consented to Jesus' release, the other Gospels tell us that the crowd then added their voices to the priest's call for his death. Pilate knows that he doesn't have any grounds for condemning Jesus, so in frustration he throws it back at the priests. But of course, they can't crucify anyone, only the Romans can. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to our law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. So they admit that the real charge, the thing that has made them so intent in getting rid of Jesus is that they considered him a blasphemer, that he had claimed to be God. You know, what's Pilate going to do to that? Verse 8, therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, <laughs> hey, listen, they've kept this one out, right? Have you noticed that? They've not said this before. He claims to be a king, knowing because that's what's going to get the Romans riled up. If they had come with it, he claims to be God, Pilate would have gone, yes, yeah, so? <laughs> uh, I hear that regularly. It's no big deal. So what? And therefore, when Pilate heard that saying, he was more, the more afraid and went again into the praetorium and said to Jesus, uh, where are you from? <laughs> and Jesus gave no answer. So as Governor Pilate had certainly heard of Jesus before this, the whole region was abuzz with talk of the miracle-working rabbi from Galilee, but the claim that he was the Son of God was new to him, and it troubled Pilate. And here's why. Many Romans were ultra-superstitious. You see, according to their religion, they believed in many gods. And the gods would occasionally take human form, both gods and goddesses, and they would come and they would, how do I say this? Um, they would date a human being. Yeah, they'd go out on a date. You know? You know what I mean? And, uh, and a kid would be the result. Someone who was half God, half human. G name me a famous Hercules. Which, which is interesting because you know the real name is Heracles. Yeah, it's Heracles been corrupted over time, so we call him Hercules. Perseus. Perseus is another. So you have these uh, demigods, if you will, or these uh, superhumans uh, that are the result of one of the gods and a human. And sometimes, sometimes uh, the, the gods would just take human form in their mythology. And there were some Romans that believed that this happened. And so now that Pilate has encountered Jesus. He, he's talked to him, and he's sensed something's going on. And now he hears from the Jewish priests that Jesus calls himself the Son of God. And he's heard the stories. Hey, you guys tell me, what happens when a human being messes with one of the gods? It doesn't go well. It doesn't go well. So he, he goes in. Where are you from? <laughs> Tell me more. And what does Jesus do? Doesn't say anything. He's not going to entertain. He's not going to uh, elaborate on Pilate's suspicions. 
His superstitions. There's, there's no backing for that. There's, there's no reference in Pilate's thinking for who Jesus actually is. Because Pilate doesn't have that kind of religious background, philosophical training. Also, what, what made this worse, Matthew tells us in his gospel that Pilate's wife had sent him a message while all of this was going on. So imagine, you know, Pilate, he's interviewing Jesus, and one of his attendants walks up and hands him a note. You know? He opens up the note. Hey, honey, I had a dream about some guy named Jesus. Have nothing to do with him. Your darling, Claudia, you know, and she, he's like, <laughs> so yeah, his wife had his wife had sent him a message earlier in the day while this all of this is going on. I had a dream about this guy Jesus. Don't have anything to do with him. Okay. So Pilate gives Jesus an opportunity to speak. Jesus doesn't say anything. Verse 10. Then Pilate said to him, Are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and the power to release you? Don't you know who I am? I'm the governor. I hold your life in my hand. Pilate is not used to being ignored. And he reminds Jesus of his authority. He wanted to compel him to speak and uses the leverage of his position. Verse 11, Jesus answered, You could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Jesus reminds Pilate of something every ruler knows. He was only in his position because a higher authority had placed him there. And authority given must be accounted for. How Pilate used his authority would determine not Jesus' fate, it determined Pilate's fate. And with that answer, Jesus turns the tables on Pilate and lets him know the governor is not judging Jesus. Rather, what Pilate decides about Jesus judges Pilate. No one judges Christ, friends. It's the other way around. What we decide about Jesus decides our fate, not his. As Pilate felt himself being backed into a corner, <laughs> Jesus told him that while he would indeed have to answer for what he did, the greater reckoning would be that of the high priest, Caiaphas, and his father-in-law, Annas. Verse 12. From then on, Pilate sought to, what? Release him. But the Jews cried out saying, uh, just pause right there. Anybody here feel kind of sorry for Pilate? Anybody here fall, fall, feel sorry for him? I, I, I feel sorry for this guy. He's being squeezed. Politics. <laughs> See, that joke wouldn't have been at all funny last week, but it's funny now. <laughs> Got a whole new realm of jokes coming, folks. <laughs> From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. Whoever makes himself a king speaks against Caesar. So well, Pilate decided Jesus really was innocent, should be released. When the priests realized that was the direction things were going, they play their ace in the hole. They play their trump card. They knew Pilate was on probation. Pilate's on probation. Pilate, uh, l let's be honest, Pilate was not that sharp a guy. Um, Pilate was a political appointee. He had been put into his office because in Rome, it was all about climbing the government ladder. That's every, everybody who was anybody in Rome, you climbed the, the ladder. You didn't start out up here. You all started at the bottom, but the whole goal was to move up. A good part of your career was determined by your military service. And then you would, if you were a successful military leader, then when you uh, got out of the legions, uh, you would start the, what was known as the, um, uh, the, the uh, I forget the name of it now, but the, it had a name. Cursus, I don't remember. Anyway, it was a ladder of political advancement. And of course, the goal was to become emperor. So Pilate comes from a wealthy family, and uh, by connections, he ends up getting this appointment. He's appointed by the emperor. Okay, you go be governor of 
Israel was not exactly a plum appointment because the Jews were a thorn in everybody's side. So go, to, go there. So he goes, and he's, he's ruling in Israel. And he ends up making some mistakes, really ticking the Jewish leadership off. So they get a little contingent of them together. They get on a ship and they sail to Rome. And they go before the emperor and they complain about Pilate. He did this. And here's all the witnesses to prove it. A message comes back to Pilate. Idiot, don't do that again. Well, he, he does something else that upsets this, the Jews. They send another contingent. Now, this is strike two. And, and uh, uh, Augustus actually had sent back a message and it said, uh, that's two strikes. Next offense, next time I hear a complaint about you, you're out you are coming back to Rome, and that's the end of your career, your political career. You're done. So Pilate, at this point, he can't, you know, he can't take off the Jewish leadership. And that's why, do you, look what they say here. You're no friend of Caesar's. You have a duty to take anybody that claims to be a king and to, to, to end them. Now, so the choice is yours. Let Jesus go or it's the end of your career. Because if you don't do what we want, we're getting on a ship. What's Pilate going to do? He caves. He caves. Verse 13. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabatha. This is a tile or a mosaic floor. The Romans love their mosaics. We find them in many Roman ruins in Israel. The courtyard of the governor's palace would certainly have had a mosaic there. So Pilate has the guards bring Jesus out. He sits to let all know that he's ready to render his final verdict. Verse 14, now it was the preparation day of the Passover and about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, behold your king. So Mark tells us that Jesus was put on the cross about the third hour which is 9 a.m. So how do we reconcile John saying that Pilate didn't render judgment until the sixth hour? Well, Mark reckons from Jewish time, John uses the Roman system. Jews numbered their hours from sunrise, about 6 a.m., while the Romans began their hours at midnight. So Pilate issued his verdict sometime between 6 and 7. Verse 15, but they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but what? What self-respecting Jew says we have no king but Caesar? Who says that? Shouldn't all the common people at this point rise up and look at the chief priest and say, no, put those guys on the cross. Every self-respecting Jew has one king. Who? God. And, and the descendant of David. But certainly not that clown in Rome. Oh my goodness. Then they delivered him to them to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. So Pilate tried one last time for the compassion of the crowd, but the priests overrode him and swayed them to demand Jesus' death. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, Jesus in the center. History tells us the Romans placed crucifixions alongside busy roads to maximize the warning to anyone thinking about rebelling. There was a major road that led out of the northern gate of Jerusalem towards the city of Damascus. It ran along the base of a limestone cliff that had been a quarry. And the masons had dug into the cliff face so that it looked like a skull from here up. Eyes, kind of a little ridge of a nose, and it was kind of at a little bit of an angle, kind of leering over this road that goes right by. And the, it just was a perfect place, this leering skull, over this busy road, great place for them to hold their crucifixions. 
we often get, we talk about the hill of Calvary or the hill of Golgotha, you know, Skull Hill. And we think, right, we always see the movies and everything is up on top of the hill, right? No, it was alongside busy roads because the whole point was to put those people as close to traffic and crowds as possible as a warning to them. He didn't put it on some hill far, far away like we have in the song. It's right there. The, the, the cross uh, would be put into a hole in the ground uh, that would be held into, uh, uh, into the ground. They'd put rocks and wedges of wood in there and, uh, and to hold up the, the cross. And it was right there, right? The, the person's head who's being crucified is just a couple feet above where everybody else's head is. And typically people would go by and they would see this and man, don't mess with Rome. This is, what, this is what happens to you. Jesus was executed along with two thieves. They would carry the cross beams that they were to be impaled on to the place where there's a post laying on the ground. The cross beam would then be laid down and nailed to that upright. They would be laid down on their backs, nails driven through the wrists and the arches of the feet. And then once they're impaled on the wood, then that is lifted up and dropped into the hole and the base wedged in tightly. Verse 19, now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Then many of the Jews read this title, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So there it is. Listen, many of the Jews read this. Is this on top of a hill, or is this in front of a hill along a busy road? Okay, so let's, let's get that image out of our out of our minds, you know, up top of a hill where everybody can kind of see it from a distance. No, this is right there, a little sign that people can read. Therefore, the chief priests and of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I've written, I've written. You know, he's done with them at this point. Attached to the cross of the condemned, was a list of charges specifying why they, were be put, why they were being put to death. Jesus has simply said his name and his title. The Jewish rulers were offended. They saw it as Pilate's way to mark his displeasure with them. And so they went running back to the praetorium with the demand that he alter the charge from Jesus' title to his claim. And Pilate, in effect, says, buzz off. Verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to each soldier a part, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothes they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Uh, crucifixion detail was not one that most soldiers look forward to. Oftentimes, the soldiers that were assigned this detail, it was a punishment. As compensation for the grisly task, they were allowed to keep the garments of those that were crucified because they were hung naked. It was one of the ways to shame those that were being executed. So there's four of them that are at this execution detail. They take up the clothing and they divide it four ways. But when they come to Jesus' tunic, instead of rending it, tearing it, uh, they look at it and they say, wait, hold on. Before... By the way, remember, cloth is expensive. And they would take pieces of cloth and they would keep it with them so they could patch up their own clothes. Uh, but when they get to his tunic, they look at it and they go, oh, we can't tear this four ways. It's, it's a seamless garment. This was a method of weaving that was done at that time where they would actually make a garment without seams. And it was expensive. So this had been a gift that somebody had given to Jesus. As a rabbi, no doubt they had wanted to honor him, and so someone had put some money into this, some benefactor. We, we never read who it was, but this gift was given to Jesus. And when they look at it, they say, man, we, <laughs> this is a nice tunic. We can't tear this. And so they instead have to get out their dice, which, by the way, every Roman soldier had a bag of dice, because guess what they did on their free time? Yeah, they, they gambled. This, is, this was what they did. Interesting that when we find Roman camps on the stone where they camped, there's uh, their dice games etched into the, the ground because they would roll their dice and they had to land in these kind of circles. Laurie, do you remember when we saw that at the Praetorium? Uh, there's this uh, called the Lithostratos in, in Jerusalem and it's carved right into the stone there. 
and we're thinking, you know, this, well, this is where may, some of them may have been gambling while Jesus is being tried. Anyway, so uh, they get out their dice and they, they cast lots for it, which is interesting because that was prophetic. It was said that they would divide his clothes and cast lots for them. Why cast lots for them? Well, because he has this seamless tunic that they did not want to ruin. That's in Psalm 22, verse 18. Now, now some people have wondered if we're to find a special meaning in Jesus' seamless tunic. Uh, well, m- maybe this. The high priest's tunic was to be a seamless tunic. That's the only other tunic that we know of that was identified as it was supposed to be made without seams. And here's Jesus' tunic that's mentioned without seams because Jesus is, in fact, our real high priest. Verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, so his aunt, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. This is entirely keeping with social custom. A family was to take care of its own members. Mary was John's aunt, the sister of his mother, Salome. Both the Gospels and Acts tell us that Jesus had younger brothers. And the question is, well, why didn't they take care of their mom? Well, following the resurrection, the followers of Christ bonded together in a tight-knit community. But, hey, listen, it took a little while for Jesus' brothers to come to faith in him. It's amazing. It took them a while. And in the meantime, John ends up becoming uh, a, a son to Mary, treats, his, treats her like mom. Verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. And so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Therefore, because it was the preparation day that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Deuteronomy 21 forbids dead bodies remaining on a tree overnight, lest they defile the land. So seeing that this is a a doubly holy day, uh, they, the uh, religious leaders go to Pilate and they say, hey, listen, we know that these people that are crucified, they can last up there for a while. And, you know, this is, we have a holy day coming in. So we can't have them hang on the tree because they might die and then they're going to file the day. So go break their legs. And the idea is when their legs are broken, they can't push themselves up to take a breath anymore and they'll suffocate. So break their legs and within 15 minutes, they're gone. And so they, they come to do that. And the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. So John was there. He's, he stayed at the scene until this takes place. So The guards come, they break the legs of the two thieves, they come to Jesus, they look up. They don't see his chest rising. He's slumped. The pallor of death has taken his his skin. They they think, well, he's dead. And then one of the soldiers think, well, what if he's not? You know, what if he revives? And so he takes his spear, you know, kind of poke him. See, you know, poke him, see if we can wake him up. Well, when he pokes him, he hits him in exactly the right spot and the skin between the ribs and the point of that spear goes in it ruptures the pericardium, which is a lining around the heart. And then blood and water flow out. You can see that there's a, the blood and water has separated because that's what happens when the heart ruptures. When the heart ruptures, the plasma and the uh, blood corpuscles separate. And so when you have this uh, separation of the plasma from the blood itself, it's the evidence that the heart has ruptured. Well, literally, Jesus died of a broken heart. His heart was trying to pump blood around his body. He's dehydrated. He's lost a lot of blood, and his heart just literally exploded. And that's the proximate cause of his, his death. 
verse 36, for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. And then he quotes Psalm 34, not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture, Zechariah 12, they shall look on him whom they, what? Pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. And then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in stripes of linens with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they lay Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. While well, the eleven went into hiding after the crucifixion, two others who'd been secret supporters stepped up and showed their devotion when it was even more dangerous than before. I find this interesting. That you have the disciples, the official disciples, that when Jesus is arrested, they, they split, go into hiding. And then you've got these guys that were secret followers of Jesus, Joseph and Nicodemus, while Jesus is alive, then when it becomes dangerous to be associated with them, they're like, hello. <laughs> and they step forward. Interesting kind of irony there. That these guys that had been worried before about their status with their fellow Jews, of identifying with Jesus. When they see what Jesus has done, when they see the price that he's been willing to pay, they, 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 they what, what was I doing? What was I thinking? If he would do that, it's time for me to step up. And they come for his body. They, they receive his body. They take it to the tomb, which is nearby, which gives us a clue. This is, it has to be very close because it's two guys. They're carrying the body, and they've got 100 pounds of these aloes, which they're going to put into the shroud that they've wrapped the body in. Uh, which was not a man's work, and these are wealthy guys. Joseph is a wealthy man. Nicodemus is obviously a wealthy man. He's a leader of Israel, member of the Sanhedrin. And these guys don't know what they're doing. Uh, burying bodies was a woman's work, a woman's job. And so, uh, but they, they, these guys take the body, and you can kind of picture the two of them. <laughs> you know, you get the feet, I'll get the arm. And they carry it a little ways over to this tomb, and we're told that it's Joseph's tomb. It's his family tomb. It's in Jerusalem. He's from Arimathea, but every good Jew wanted to be buried in Jerusalem as close to the temple as possible. And so there's this tomb right there near where Jesus was crucified. They, they put it in this new tomb where no body has been laid. They wrap the body. They put the aloes in. And there's a group of women that are watching this. The, the women that, that, that know Jesus, the, the four ladies that are there. They're following at a distance. And they're watching. You can just imagine. They've done this before. And they're watching these two guys pack the body. And they're going, no, what are they doing? Mary, what are they doing? I don't know, but that's pitiful. Those guys have no idea what they're doing. The sun's setting. The sun's going down. They're, they're, you're looking at the horizon, and you see the sun sinking, and you see the crescent of the sun. And when that sun slips below the horizon, Sabbath has started. They can't touch the body. And then they can't touch it the entire Sabbath. The first time that they can come back is when? Sunday morning. And so that's why these women come back to the tomb. First opportunity that they have to do what? To do a proper job of burying Jesus' body. But guess what? When they get back, he ain't there. He's risen from the dead. Father, thank you for your, your faithfulness to us, your, your goodness. Jesus, thank you for rising from the dead. Because of your resurrection, everything has changed. Oh, Lord, how thankful we are tonight that you endured all of that. Because it opens heaven for us. Thank you for finishing the work of our salvation. And now we get to live the privilege of a new life because you rose from the dead. Lord, we love this gospel. We love this story. Um, 
I can't wait till we can get to heaven and say thanks to John for writing this. It's such a great story. Thank you that it's all true. In your name we pray. Amen.